The United States Vice President Mike Pence warned Pyongyang not to test the strength and resolve of America's military. Pence delivered that message from Seoul during the first leg of his Asia tour to assure allies of U.S. support in the region. The DPRK attempted and failed the missile test on Sunday during weekend celebrations for the country's late founder, Kim Il-sung. But it did not conduct a sixth nuclear test, as some were predicting. We begin our coverage with CGTN's John Terrett. He joins us from New York. And John, the world is firmly focused on Pyongyang right now, but we've known about this, these missile tests and these nuclear tests for some time. So why now are they focused so firmly on this country? Well, Anand, hello from New York. And you're absolutely right. I mean, the DPRK, it's a tactic that they've been using for many, many years. And I think the last time that they really ratcheted up the ante was back in 2013 with nuclear tests and missile tests and that sort of thing. So we know that they do it, and they do it to be provocative, to get notice, to win diplomatic concessions. And, of course, seen from their perspective, they also, every time they launch one of these missiles, even if it fails like the one at the weekend did, they are just a step closer, a little bit closer to their stated aim, which is to be an independent nuclear nation. Now, the latest news that we have about what's going on in the world is that there could be a missile test a week now, according to a spokesperson in North Korea speaking to an international broadcaster earlier today. And here in America, the Fox News Channel reporting that a U.S. missile system is now on its way to South Korea. So I suppose that is fresh news. But what is really news and what is really keeping the world on its toes at the moment is that in the White House is President Trump. And in his own way, Anand, he is unpredictable like the North Korean leader Kim Jong Un. And this is the thing that everybody is concerned about. Within the last week, we've seen President Trump launch 59, 60 actually, cruise missiles at that Syria base, allegedly responsible for the chemical attack in Idlib province. And he dropped the mother of all bombs on ISIS in Afghanistan. And the big question is, will he be provoked by the actions of the North Koreans? We just don't know. And that's what's making all of this just a little bit more anxiety making than we've been used to in recent history. Anand? John, the U.S. Vice President Mike Pence visited the uh, demilitarized zone. That's the area separating the north from the south. Let's take a listen to what he had to say. More than some quarter century ago that we first learned of the presence of nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula in the possession of North Korea. Now, there was an agreed framework. There was a period of strategic patience. But the era of strategic patience is over. Now, President Trump has made it clear that the patience of the United States and our allies in this region has run out, and we want to see change. So, John, what are the options on the table for the United States? Well, as you heard there, Pence is saying that the patience of the U.S. and its allies has run out, and he's also said within the past 24-hour news cycle to the North Koreans, don't test President Trump. Now, my own opinion is that the DPRK is hedging its bets, that Kim Jong-un is betting that, like President Trump, along with all other American presidents in recent history, will come to the conclusion that any kind of preemptive strike on the DPRK is simply too costly in every way. So let's rule that out for the time being. What else might the United States do? Well, it could impose an oil embargo. North Korea depends very heavily on oil, mostly flowing in from China. It uses coal to heat its buildings, but it uses the oil to run its military. It could also ban the airline, the national flag carrier, from flying to key airports. It could also intercept ships, and it could also interfere with the working of the so-called second-tier banks in China, which are the ones that do business and make money directly with North North Korea. And it could do that either alone or with the backing of the United Nations behind me or with the help of China. And I would just draw your attention to 10 years ago, 2007, when the U.S. acting alone froze $25 million worth of money owned by the elite in North Korea at a bank based in Macau called the Banco Delta Asia. Now, that really hurt the elite whose money that was in that bank. And it, it was a way of punishing North Korea with without using any kind of weapons, Anand. 
John, given all the heated uh, diplomatic rhetoric that we're hearing, how might China help calm things down? Well, I do think China is key. I mean, I really, really do. And even more so since we had the meeting in Mar-a-Lago a couple of weeks ago between President Xi and President Trump in Florida. I mean, it seems to me that China is siding with the United States now above the DPRK. Now, that's not to say that China doesn't support the DPRK. Of course it does. It's its main sponsor. And the thing that China does not want more than anything is for there to be any kind of conflagration on the Korean Peninsula, because that would almost certainly result in the South moving north, as it were. And at the moment, China is very keen to keep the buffer between the DMZ, South Korea, and its own border. So it wants Kim Jong-un and his government to stay in place. But it does not like the saber rattling that's been going on, the nuclear testing, the threats of more nuclear testing, the missile testing, that sort of thing. So is China helping in all this or not? The answer is it's too early to say. We simply don't know. There's no real way of knowing. But I have identified three things which will help you. If you see China imposing any kind of restrictions on those two-tier banks that I was talking about, then China will be helping the United States. If you see China suddenly coming up with a need to repair that long oil pipeline that goes into North Korea, maybe for three months or six months, which will crimp the amount of oil going into the country, then China's helping. And, of course, if China helps with international, other international entities to interrupt North Korean shipping in the waters off the peninsula, then China certainly will be helping. I also think China is the best chance for dialogue with Pyongyang. Although it's worth pointing out, Arnan, that at the moment, Kim Jong-un doesn't talk to anybody, and I don't think he's even picking up the telephone to Beijing. Arnan? Thanks, John. That's CGTN's John Terrett reporting from New York. Well, let's get to our panel right now. Joining us from Beijing is Shindo Xu. He's a political analyst with China Radio International. Here with us in our Washington, D.C. studio is Yonho Kim. He's a senior researcher of the U.S. Korea Institute at Johns Hopkins University. Also with us is Douglas Powell. He's the vice president for studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And Wang Guan is the chief political correspondent with CGTN America's Mandarin Service. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Yonho Kim, let me start with you. Well, as we've heard, tensions are rising. We have Vice President Mike Pence talk about all options being on the table. The... Uh, DPRK, the deputy vice, um, at least the deputy foreign minister there, saying that uh, his country is on maximum alert for a U.S. attack. Are we close to a war here? Well, I think uh, the Trump administration is sticking to so-called maximum pressure and engagement uh, that has been reported by the American media last week. Uh, we have been seeing so far the uh, maximum pressure part only, and we still don't know when and under what conditions we're going to see the engagement part uh, to be kicked in. But again, I don't think the U.S. is willing to risk any um, all-out war on the Korean Peninsula, which would lead to devastating consequences. And when you look at uh, the statements that uh, Pyongyang has been issued over the last week, um, it sounds more defensive than offensive. Uh, they were talking about counter actions against the U.S. and defending itself mm -hmm. from um, Washington's provocations. So obviously they are very alarmed by how serious uh, Trump is uh, about their nuclear development. But again, uh, I think uh, the Pyongyang's ba basic message is that they are not intimidated by Trump, but obviously they don't want to go to war with the U.S. Dr. Spall, what is your view on this? You know, there's, there's a lot about this episode from March to the present, which we see every year. What's new this year is the Trump administration and their willingness to speak out in ways that the previous administration has not been. And uh, I think what we're seeing is an effort by the Trump administration, new in office, with a lot of fairly inexperienced people in this part of the world, thinking they might get to a solution of this problem by putting enough pressure, mostly pressure on China, <clears throat> China to... Uh, suffer sanctions and trade, um, trade problems if they don't help, and China to do more to help stem the threat of this n increasing North Korean capability, lest the United States make more instability on the peninsula in response to it. So uh, China is trying to manage the problem, manage Washington, keep it from becoming a big problem, and the U.S. is trying to seek a solution for which there probably isn't 
a happy outcome. That solution that you're talking about, Douglas, what, what is it? I mean, is the ideal situation that the DPRK give up its entire nuclear arsenal, give up the program completely? If you, if you judge the administration by its words, that's what they're aiming for, and that's what they say in private. This is an effort to get denuclearization. Now, there are big decisions that haven't been made about whether we would accept the current level of nuclear capability and try to freeze that. They're not there yet. They're still looking at dismantlement of the entire uh, enterprise. Now, there may be stages to get there, and there may be talks offered at some point. But right now, we're in the maximum pressure on China for China to shut the fuel off, as John said, in New York, mm -hmm. or to do it as it's already done, which is turn back coal shipments, uh, cease commercial air flights into Pyongyang, and other signs that China can uh, put the screws to North Korea. Shin Deshu in Beijing, what is the view uh, as far as the Chinese are concerned? You know, we did have the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi warn at one time is that if there's any kind of stability in the DPRK, it's going to be chaos on China's doorstep. Well, of course, China is very much concerned about the situation. You know, this is uh, uh, getting uh, more escalating from the both sides. Uh, uh, well, China is urging basically both sides to step back a little bit and then seek a peaceful solution. China is uh, applying pressure on the North Korean side. You can see the you know boats uh, loaded with uh, coal uh, now being turned back from the Chinese port to uh, North Korea, and also China is communicating with the U.S. side. You know the phone conversation between the two presidents and also the top diplomats. And obviously, uh, China is also probably talking to the North Korean side, trying to pre uh, persuade them not to continue with a, a new missile test a, a couple of days later, probably. So uh, China is still working very hard toward a peaceful solution, uh, because China sees no other options to solve this problem right now. Wang Wang, the U.S. has put much of the onus for resolving this situation on the Korean Peninsula on China. Uh, we even heard President Trump say at one point that China needs to do something. If China doesn't do anything about this, then we will act on our own unilaterally. And just this past weekend, we heard John McCain, the senator from Arizona, talking uh, about this. He was talking on a U.S. political show, a talk show called Meet the Press. Let's take a listen to what he said. China is the key. They can stop this if they want to because of their control over the North Korean economy. And by the way, I would point out, and I know this will come up later on, but there are artillery on the border between North and South Korea that can reach Seoul. Mm -hmm. And we can't take them all out before. I mean, this is a very serious. This may be the first test of this of this presidency, but China can shut them down and we should be, whether they're currency manipulators or not, we should expect them to act to prevent what could be a, a cataclysmic event. So everything is being pointed to China right now. Well, yes, I, I think in addition to my colleague in Beijing just said, uh, I think it's worth pointing out that China, in fact, uh, stopped exporting 160 types of technology, softwares, and equipments to Pyongyang, to North Korea. And also, uh, we see a uh, slowdown of tourism to North Korea. If you talk to Dandong, this border town uh, travel agencies, and also uh, Air China, China's flagship carrier, it's said to have reduced flights to Pyongyang. Uh, all that taken into account, I think China is in a very difficult situation right now. For, on one hand, a prior, according to our Chinese sources, it does, Beijing does prioritize its relations with the United States. We can see that from the summit meetings mm -hmm. between the two presidents. It won a great relationship, a great start, uh, of a relationship with the United States, with the Trump administration. Um, so to some extent, um, I think Beijing is willing to accommodate uh, Washington's concerns. But on the other hand, uh, after all, um, Pyongyang and the North Korean issue is an issue um, derived from the Cold War. Um, China has long seen North Korea, Korea as a strategic uh, asset. Um, so to hedge against America's militarization of the uh, Asia Pacific area. Yeah, okay. The United States says that. something. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you know, like uh, our pre previous speakers, you know, both of them talked about, like two of them talked about, uh, and also, of course, Senator John McCain talked about, like, he is China. But I think there's uh, 
a sort of like misperception here. You know, you have to understand what North Korea wants really from this confrontation with the U.S., with South Korea. What they want is really a, a, a security a guarantee from the United States. So what they want is a promise the U.S. will not attack North Korea. What they want is not a regime change in North Korea. So it's like China cannot promise them. China cannot guarantee North Korea that there will not be attack from the U.S., that not will be a regime change from the U.S. So ultimately, it's really between North Korea and the United States to solve this problem. So, Dr. Spala, are we ultimately talking about a peace treaty here? That's what the DPRK wants? That's one of the things they want. There's quite an extensive list. When we've had uh, close to the end negotiations with North Korea in the past, their list keeps growing oh. out of Japan, out of South Korea, peace treaty, aid, recomp recompense for the war, all sorts of things that are just politically impossible. So we have to go into any negotiations understanding they're going to play that game. Uh, but I do think a smart administration move would be to have packaged uh, a coalition effort, multiple nations around North Korea, trying to put on the table all the things that they want in exchange for giving up those programs. I doubt very much North Korea would take it, but if you want to hold a coalition together to go on to sanctions and other things you may have to do, you should start with a, a major peace effort. Now, we have a problem in that the uh, new administration in Washington doesn't really have any diplomats at the top. They're all military people right. and inexperienced people in this part of the world. And so it may take some mistakes and experimentation before we get to that outcome. So the most extreme actions would be the actions of last resort then? Well, I would certainly hope so, Right. for the reasons John McCain mentioned in his tape. Yeah, uh, you know, Kim, the United States says it's going to go ahead with its anti-missile uh, THAAD system. It will deploy that in South Korea. There, of course, uh, the United States has military uh, troops in, uh, on the border, 28,000 troops there. It also has naval vessels uh, in the vicinity. Uh, is any of this acting as a deterrent? Yes. Um... It has been, uh, you know, very uh, strong a force against uh, possible North Korea's, um, uh, you know, provocations. But we have seen um, the sinking of Chonan and uh, uh, Yampeng Island shelling uh, in 2010. So I hate to say this, but North Korea has been very creative, if you will, in, uh, you know, planning their provocations. And uh, uh, both the U.S. and South Korea has been uh, very weak on this front. Right, that is true. But if we listen to the response from the United States that's coming out now, let's take a listen to what Vice President Mike Pence said about the uh, response that the DPRK could face. Let's watch this. We will continue to deploy the THAAD missile defense system as a defensive measure called for by the alliance and for the alliance. We will continue to evolve a comprehensive set of capabilities to ensure the security of South Korea. And as our Secretary of Defense made clear here in South Korea not long ago, we will defeat any attack and we will meet any use of conventional or nuclear weapons with an overwhelming and effective response. They have to be hearing that in Pyongyang, right? Right. What would they make of that? Well, um, first of all, I, I'd like to uh, emphasize on the uh, resolution of both countries, the U.S. and South Korea, to deploy the threat against the North Korean uh, you know, growing uh, threat from North Korea. Uh, but um, what I understand is both the U.S. and South Korea uh, have agreed to uh, let the next South Korean government right. um, make uh, the you know, finalize the, the installation of the threat yeah. deployment. Although their uh, you know stance is basically that. Uh, there's no change in their uh, deployment plan. And um, Moon Jae-in uh, of Liberal uh, Democratic Party, he is the leading uh, can uh, presidential candidate, has uh, called for a review of this matter by the next government. But I don't think he has much room to cancel the de decision, especially when you have growing tension on the Korean Peninsula. And he even said last week that if North Korea keep uh, provoking, then uh, there is no choice but uh, to the South Korean government but to uh, keep uh, uh, going uh, with this that uh, deployment plan. Uh, right. So that's the fact on the ground in South Korea, I think. 
Wang Guan, the reports this weekend, this past weekend, even some evidence from satellite images that the DPRK was planning another uh, nuclear test. Uh, it didn't go ahead with that mm -hmm. nuclear test. It didn't go ahead with a missile test, and that failed because the missile exploded on takeoff. Uh, but getting back to the nuclear test, do you think the reason it didn't carry it out was because of pressure from China? Did China say, don't do this? I think to some extent, but to what extent? It is a myth because the last time a senior North Korean official visited China was two months ago when they sent its vice foreign minister to Beijing and met with Wang Yi, China's top diplomat, China's foreign minister, rather. Um, but also, don't forget, the last time before that meeting, the last time a North, a North Korean senior official visited China was nine months ago. So there was a nine months a period in which there were no senior North Korean officials visiting uh, China. And also, Kim Jong-un assumed office five years ago, and he hasn't uh, met up with President Xi Jinping once, not once. So um, there is a, obviously a cooling down, at least uh, at the level of heads of state and cabinet levels when it comes to uh, exchanges. So. Uh, it's also a myth that uh, North Koreans' nuclear capabilities can really strike continental in the United States. You know, this past weekend, uh, I talked to Raphael Wolber, uh, a senior journalist from APTN who has been reporting inside North Korea for the past 15 years. It's like um, most of the more of the the more reliable sources indicate that perhaps uh, the North Koreans can uh, launch a missile, hit uh, the island of Guam, but to see to say that it can successfully launch a missile. Um, making sure it runs smoothly and um, making sure it explodes uh, at the precise location is a, on the continental United States uh, is a bit of a far-fetched uh, media hype. But is there a recognition that there could be a missile that could reach South Korea very easily? Yeah, yes. I think a respected U.S. Uh, nuclear scientist, uh, uh, Reid Hector, visited the, the North Korean Yongbyon nuclear site a few years ago, and he was surprised at uh, the central fuse devices uh, at work in Yeonbyon uh, facilities, and uh, he's saying that uh, basically nuclear, the nuclear capabilities of North Korea is developing at a very fast pace, perhaps faster than the outside world uh, has predicted, had predicted. Okay. Shindu, uh, the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi has also been calling for calm. Let's uh, listen to what he had to say. China has always resolutely opposed any moves that would increase or provoke tensions. History has proven that weapons cannot solve problems and that dialogue is the only way out. On the issue of the Korean Peninsula, it's not about who can say the most hateful words, about who can raise the biggest fist, who will win. Rather, once war breaks out, there will be losses on all sides. No one is the real winner. So, Shindu, does the foreign minister have a point there that there are going to be no winners if this breaks out into conflict? Uh, obviously, if there's a military conflict or rather a war, you can see, of course, North Korea will be uh, suffering uh, hugely from the U.S. attack. But also remember, uh, the, Seoul, the city of Seoul, uh, uh, South Korean capital, will be well within the range of North Korean's artillery. Uh, the city of millions of people will be destroyed. And also China and South Korea will also be suffered from the influx of refugees from North Korea side. At the same time, remember, North Korea, uh, China, the United States will not remain intact uh, because you know, North Korean officials right now are talking about uh, a preemptive uh, nuclear strike with their own, their own way, uh, their own style. We don't know what kind of attack that could be, but obviously uh, it's very hard for the U.S. You know, to be free from any retaliation from North Korean side. So everybody will lose if there's uh, you know, uh, uh, escalation of tension, if there's a military conflict uh, in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, Douglas, this is a bit of a cliche, but we've been here before, haven't we? I was thinking deja vu all over again. This, <laughs> this is something we go through every year. As I said earlier, the new factor here is the arrival of a Trump administration with new people showing up in South Korea, saying what things I would have written 25 years ago. All cards are on the table, no options are dismissed. You know, you're on, you're on guard. Um, but, you know, even, even the description in the press of the arrival of the Vincent Battle Group mm -hmm. as supposed to escalate the situation. Well, actually, the Vincent is going in to replace the Reagan, which is in a repair yard, and the nearest other carriers are on the west coast of the U.S. So, actually, there are no carriers near the Korean Peninsula right. this week. And they won't be until the end of the week. There so was, I think there's too much tension built into the commentary. Yeah, there was an interesting interview in the Los Angeles Times. They interviewed the former Defense Secretary, William Perry. And he said that the United States was on the verge of attacking uh, 
North Korea, the DPRK, in 1994. In fact, war plans were ready. They were about to launch this. But they backed down at the end because they thought, well, the consequence. He, he said so. He said, we, we considered the consequences and decided that this attack uh, should not go ahead. Bill Perry is a wise man, and he mm -hmm. understands the situation quite well. By, by the way, they also had a sort of not terribly well-coordinated diplomatic initiative in 1994 where Jimmy Carter went over right. and, and sort of broke the ice and got uh, the, the situation created where actual diplomatic talks could proceed. Yeah. Yon Ho, sometimes we forget that there is, there was a di diplomatic uh, roadmap which was already uh, in place, the six-party talks. Uh, that hasn't gone away. It's still there. Um, could it come back? What would a diplomatic solution look like? Well, as you said, uh, everybody knows, I think, uh, as far as the, all the parties involved in the North Korea problem understands that uh, there's no viable uh, military solution right. to this. So um, I think the South Korean uh, government, the next South Korean government, uh, has some kind of mission, if you will, uh, to come up with uh, 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 creating some room for diplomatic solutions here uh, because both the U.S. and uh, North Korea, they're uh, playing kind of a brinkmanship game for now. So uh, I think um, all the leading candidates uh, in South Korea, uh, they prefer a dialogue to uh, confrontation with uh, North Korea, although they are all uh, emphasizing the importance of uh, maintaining sanctions on North Korea. Uh, and again, I think on day one, the next South Korean government would seek for a diplomatic solution. I want one very quickly. We have a minute mm -hmm. left. Something we forget sometimes is that China and the DPRK are treaty allies. They signed a treaty in 1961, the right. Sino-North Korea Treaty. Uh, and under the terms of that treaty, China is obliged to come to the DPRK's rescue if it is attacked, if there is outside aggression. Does but the wording of that treaty is very interesting. Yeah. It has its own conditions. It says uh, if there were an unprovoked war against each side, each side should come to each other's defense. So say if North Korea launches attacks uh, preemptively against another country, the ROK or Japan, uh, I'm not sure if that treaty covers uh, North Korea. And also, uh, the, the treaty is really about, uh, the, the exact wording in Mandarin was military, the two sides will offer military and other assistances. So that does not equate to military strike, as in the U.S. would defend Japan, in, as in the treaty allies. So I'm not sure if that uh, wording makes uh, China and North Korea uh, exact treaty allies, but uh, it's an alliance of some sort. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for joining us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. On our next episode, we'll...